Chapter 5 of The Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 5 Food Part 1 If the coming revolution is to be a social revolution, it will be distinguished from all former uprising not only by its aim, but also by its methods. To attain a new end, new means are required. The three great popular movements which we have seen in France during the last hundred years differ from each other in many ways, but they have one common feature. In each case, the people strove to overturn the old regime and spent their heart's blood for the cause. Then, after having borne the brunt of the battle, they sank again into obscurity. A government composed of men, more or less honest, was formed and undertook to organize. The Republic in 1793, Labor in 1848, and the Free Commune in 1871. Imbued with Jacobin ideas, this government occupied itself, first of all, with political questions, such as the reorganization of the machinery of government, the purifying of the administration, the separation of church and state, civic liberty, and such matters. It is true the workmen's clubs kept an eye on the members of the new government and often imposed their ideas on them. But even in these clubs, whether the leaders belonged to the middle or to the working classes, it was always the middle class ideas which prevailed. They discussed various political questions at great length, but forgot to discuss the question of bread. Great ideas sprang up at such times, ideas that have moved the world. Words were spoken which still stir our hearts at the interval of the century. But the people were starving in the slums. From the very commencement of the revolution, industry inevitably came to a stop. The circulation of produce was checked, and the capital concealed itself. The master, the employer, had nothing to fear at such times. He battened on his dividends, if indeed he did not speculate on the wretchedness around, but the wage earner was reduced to live from hand to mouth. Want knocked at the door. Famine was abroad in the land, such famine as hardly been seen under the old regime. The Girondists are starving us, was the cry of the workmen's quarters in 1793, and thereupon the Girondists were guillotined and full powers were given to the mountain and to the commune. The commune indeed concerned itself with the question of bread, and made heroic efforts to feed Paris. At Lyon, Fouché and Collot de Herbois established city granaries, but the sums spent on filling them were woefully insufficient. The town councils made great efforts to procure corn. The bakers, who hoarded flour, were hanged, and still the people lacked bread. Then they turned on the royalist conspirators and laid the blame at their door. They guillotined a dozen or fifteen a day, servants and duchesses alike, especially servants, for the duchess had gone to Coblenz. But if they had guillotined a hundred dukes and viscounts every day, it would have been equally hopeless. The want only grew, for the wage earner cannot live without his wage, and the wage was not forthcoming. What difference could a thousand corpses more or less make to him? Then the people began to grow weary. So much for your vaunted revolution. You are more wretched than ever before, whispered the reactionary in the ears of the worker, and little by little the rich took courage, emerged from their hiding places, and flaunted their luxury in the face of the starving multitude. They dressed up like scented fops, and said to the workers, Come, enough of this foolery, what have you gained by rebellion? Sick at heart, his patience at an end, the revolutionary had to at least admit to himself that the cause was lost once more. He retreated into his hovel and awaited the worst. Then the reaction proudly asserted itself, and accomplished a politic stroke. The revolution dead, nothing remained but to trample its corpse underfoot. The white terror began. Blood flowed like water. The guillotine was never idle. The prisons were crowded, while the pageant of rank and fashion resumed its old course, and went on as merrily as before. This picture is typical of all our revolutions. In 1848, the workers of Paris placed three months of starvation at the service of the Republic, and then... Having reached the limits of their powers, they made one last desperate effort, an effort which was drowned in blood. In 1871, the commune perished for lack of combatants. It had taken measures for the separation of church and state, but it neglected, alas, until too late, to take measures for providing people with bread. And so it came to pass in Paris that the elegants and fine gentlemen could spurn the confederates and bid them to go sell their lives for a miserable pittance and leave their betters to feast at their ease in fashionable restaurants. At last the commune saw its mistake, and opened communal kitchens, but it was too late. 
The days were already numbered, and the troops of Versailles were on the ramparts. Bread. It is bread that the revolution needs. Let others spend their time in issuing pompous proclamations, in decorating themselves lavishly with official gold lace, and in talking about political liberty. Be it ours to see, from the first day of the revolution to the last, in all provinces fighting for freedom, that there is not a single man who lacks bread, not a single woman compelled to stand with the weirful crowd outside the big house door, that a happily coarse loaf may be thrown to her in charity, not a single child pining for want of food. It has always been the middle-class idea to harangue about great principles, great lies, rather. The idea of the people will be to provide bread for all, and while middle-class citizens and workmen infested with middle-class ideas admire their own rhetoric in the talking shops, and practical people are engaged in endless discussions on forms of government, we, the utopian dreamers, we shall have to consider the question of daily bread. We have the temerity to declare that all have a right to bread, that there is bread enough for all, and that, with the watchword of bread for all, the revolution will triumph. Part 2 That we are utopians is well known. So utopian are we that we go the length of believing that the revolution can and ought to assure shelter, food, and clothes to all, an idea extremely displeasing to middle-class citizens, whatever their party color, for they are quite alive to the fact that it is not easy to keep the upper hand of a people whose hunger is satisfied. All the same, we maintain our contention, bread must be found for the people of the revolution, and the question of bread must take precedence of all other questions. If it is settled in the interests of the people, the revolution will be on the right road, for in solving the question of bread, we must accept the principles of equality, which will force itself upon us to the exclusion of every other solution. It is certain that the coming revolution, like in that respect to the revolution of 1848, will burst upon us in the middle of a great industrial crisis. Things have been seething for half a century now, and can only go from bad to worse. Everything tends that way. New nations entering the lists of international trade and fighting for possession of the world's markets, wars, taxes ever increasing, national debts, the insecurity of the morrow, and huge colonial undertakings in every corner of the globe. There are a million of unemployed workers in Europe at this moment. It will still be worse when a revolution has burst upon us and spread like fire, laid to the train of gunpowder. The number of outer works will be doubled as soon as barricades are erected in Europe and the United States. What is to be done to provide these multitudes with bread? We do not know whether the folk who call themselves practical people have ever asked themselves this question in all its nakedness, but we do know that they wish to maintain the wage system, and we must therefore expect to have national workshops and public works vaunted as a mean of giving food to the unemployed. Because national workshops were opened in 1789 and in 1793, because the same means were resorted to in 1848, because Napoleon III succeeded in contenting the Parisian proletariat for 18 years by giving them public works, which cost Paris today its debt of 80 million pounds, and its municipal tax of 3 or 4 pounds a head, because this excellent method of taming the beast was customary in Rome and even in Egypt 4,000 years ago, and lastly, because despots, kings, and emperors have always employed the ruse of throwing a scrap of food to the people to gain time to snatch up the whip. It is natural that the practical men should extol this method of perpetuating the wage system. What need to rack our brains when we have the time-honored method of the pharaohs at our disposal? Yet, should the revolution be so misguided as to start on this path, it would be lost. In 1848, when the national workshops were opened on February 27th, the unemployed at Paris numbered only 800. A fortnight later, they had already increased to 49,000. They would soon have been 100,000, without counting those who crowded in from the provinces. Yet, at that time, trade and manufacturers in France only employed half as many hands as today, and we know that, in the time of revolution, exchange and industry suffer most from the general upheaval. To realize this, we have only to think for a moment of the number of workmen whose labor depends directly or indirectly upon export trade, or of the number of hands employed in producing luxuries whose consumers are the middle-class minority. A revolution in Europe means the unavoidable stoppage of at least half the factories and workshops. It means millions of workers and their families thrown on the streets. And our practical men would seek to avert this truly terrible situation by means of national relief works. That is to say, by means of new industries created on the spot to give work to the unemployed. 
It is evident, as Proudhon has already pointed out, that the smallest attack upon property will bring in its train the complete disorganization of the system based on private enterprise and wage labor. Society itself will be forced to take production in hand in its entirety and to reorganize it to meet the needs of the whole people. But this cannot be accomplished in a day or a month. It must take a certain time thus to reorganize the system of production, and during this time, millions of men will be deprived of the means of subsistence. What then is to be done? There is only one really practical solution of the problem. Boldly, to face the great tasks which awaits us, and instead of trying to patch up a situation which we ourselves have made untenable, to proceed to reorganize the production on a new basis. Thus, the really practical course of action, in our view, would be that the people should take immediate possession of all the food of the insurgent districts, keeping strict account of it all, that none might be wasted, and that by the aid of these accumulated resources, everyone might be able to tide over the crisis. During that time, an agreement would have to be made with the factory workers, the necessary raw materials given them, and the means of subsistence assured to them while they work to supply the needs of the agriculture population. For we must not forget that while France weaves silks and satins to deck the wives of German financiers, the Empress of Russia, and the Queen of the Sandwich Islands, and while Paris fashions wonderful trinkets and playthings for rich folk all the world over, two-thirds of the French peasantry have not proper lamps to give them light or the implements necessary for modern agriculture. Lastly, unproductive land, of which there is plenty, would have to be turned to the best advantage, poor soils enriched, and rich soils which yet, under the present system, do not yield a quarter, no, nor a tenth of what they might produce, submitted to intensive culture, and tilled with as much care as a market garden or a flower pot. It is impossible to imagine any other practical solution of the problem, and whether we like it or not, sheer force of circumstances will bring it to pass. Part 3. The most prominent characteristic of capitalism is the wage system, which in brief amounts to this. A man, or a group of men, possessing the necessary capital, starts some industrial enterprise. He undertakes to supply the factory or workshops with raw material, to organize production, to pay the employees a fixed wage, and lastly, to pocket the surplus value or profits under pretext of recouping himself for managing the concern, for running the risk it may involve, and for the fluctuations of price in the market value of the wares. To preserve the system, those who now monopolize capital would be ready to make certain concessions, to share, for example, a part of the profits with the workers, or rather, to establish a sliding scale which would oblige them to raise wages when prices were high. In brief, they would consent to certain sacrifices, on condition that they were still allowed to direct industry and to take its first fruits. Collectivism, as we know, does not abolish wages, though it introduces considerable modifications into the existing order of things. It only substitutes the state, that is to say, representative government, national or local, for the individual employer of labor. Under collectivism, it is the representatives of the nation, or of the district, and their deputies and officials, who are to have the control of industry. It is they who reserve to themselves the right of employing the surplus of production in the interest of all. Moreover, collectivism draws a very subtle but very far-reaching distinction between the work of the laborer and of the man who has learned a craft. Unskilled labor in the eyes of the collectivist is simple labor, while the work of the craftsman, the mechanic, the engineer, the man of science, etc., is what Marx calls complex labor and is entitled to a higher wage. But laborers and craftsmen, weavers, and men of science are all wage servants of the state, all officials, as we have said lately, to gild the pill. The coming revolution can render no greater service to humanity than to make the wage system, in all its forms, an impossibility, and to render communism, which is the negation of wage slavery, the only possible solution. For even admitting that the collectivist modification of the present system is possible, if introduced gradually during a period of prosperity and peace, though, for my part, I question its practicability even under such conditions, it would become impossible in a period of revolution when the need of feeding hungry millions springs up for the first call to arms. A political revolution can be accomplished without shaking the foundations of industry, but a revolution where the people lay hands upon property will inevitably paralyze exchange and production. Millions of public money would not suffice for wages to the millions of outer works. This point cannot be too much insistent upon. The reorganization of industry 
on a new basis, and we shall presently show how tremendous this problem is, cannot be accomplished in a few days, nor, on the other hand, will the people submit to be half-starved for years in order to oblige theorists who uphold the wage system. To tide over the period of stress, they will demand what they have always demanded in such cases, communization of supplies, the giving of rations. It will be vain to preach patience. The people will be patient no longer, and if food is not put in common, they will plunder the bakeries. If the people are not strong enough to carry all before them, they will be shot down to give collectivism a fair field for experiment. To this end, order must be maintained at any price. Order, discipline, obedience. And as the capitalists will soon realize, that when the people are shot down by those who call themselves revolutionists, the revolution itself will become hateful in the eyes of the masses, and they will certainly lend their support to the champions of order, even though they are collectivists. In such a line of conduct, the capitalists will see a means of hereafter crushing the collectivists in their turn. If order is established in this fashion, the consequences are easy to foresee. Not content with shooting down the marauders, the faction of order will search out the ringleaders of the mob. They will set up again the law courts and reinstate the hangmen. The most ardent revolutionists will be sent to the scaffold. It will be 1793 over again. Do not let us forget how reaction triumphed in the last century. First, the Abeltis, the madmen, were guillotined. Those whom Mignet, with the memory of the struggle fresh upon him, still called anarchists. The Dantonists soon followed them, and when the party of Robespierre had guillotined these revolutionaries, they in turn had to mount the scaffold. Whereupon the people, sick of bloodshed, and seeing the revolution lost, threw up the sponge, and let the reactionaries do their worst. If order is restored, we say, the social democrats will hang the anarchists, the Fabien will hang the social democrats, and will in their turn be hanged by the reactionaries, and the revolution will come to an end. But everything confirms us in the belief that the energy of the people will carry them far enough, and that, when the revolution takes place, the idea of anarchist communism will have gained ground. It is not an artificial idea. The people themselves have breathed it in our ear, and the number of communists is ever increasing as the impossibility of any other solution becomes more and more evident. And if the impetus of the people is strong enough, affairs will take a very different turn. Instead of plundering the baker's shops one day and starving the next, the people of the insurgent cities will take possession of the warehouses, the cattle markets, in fact, of all the provision stores, and of all the food to be had. The well-intentioned citizens, men and women both, will form themselves into bands of volunteers and address themselves to the task of making a rough general inventory of the contents of each shop and warehouse. In 24 hours, the revolted town or district will know what Paris has not found out yet in spite of its statistical committees, and what it never did find out during the siege, the quantity of provisions it contains. In 48 hours, millions of copies will be printed of the tables, giving it sufficiently exact amounts of the available food, the places where it's stored, and the means of distribution. In every block of houses, in every street, in every town ward, bands of volunteers will have been organized. These commissariat volunteers will work in unison and keep in touch with each other. If only the Jacob and Benets did not get in the way. If only the self-styled scientific theorists did not thrust themselves into darkened counsel. Or rather, let them expound their muddle-headed theories as much as they like, provided they have no authority, no power. And that admirable spirit of organization, inherent in the people, above all in every social grade of the French nation, but which they have so seldom been allowed to exercise, will initiate, even in so huge a city as Paris, and in the midst of a revolution, an immense guild of free workers ready to furnish to each and all the necessary food. Give the people a free hand, and in ten days the food service will be conducted with admirable regularity. Only those who have never seen the people hard at work, only those who have passed their lives buried among documents, can doubt it. Speak of the organizing genius of the great misunderstood, the people, to those who have seen it in Paris in the days of the barricades, or in London during the great docker strike when half a million starving folk had to be fed, and they will tell you how superior it is to the official ineptness of bubbledom. And even supposing we had to endure a certain amount of discomfort and confusion for a fortnight or a month, surely that would not matter very much. For the mass of people, 
it would still be an improvement on their former condition and besides in times of revolution one can dine contently enough on a bit of bread and cheese while eagerly discussing events in any case a system which springs up spontaneously under stress of immediate need will be infinitely preferable to anything invented between four walls by high-bound theorists sitting on any number of committees part four the people of the great towns will be driven by force of circumstances to take possession of all the provisions beginning with the barest necessaries and gradually extending communism to other things in order to satisfy the needs of all the citizens the sooner it is done the better the sooner it is done the less misery there will be and the less strife but upon what basis must society be organized in order that all may share and share alike this is the question that meets us at the outset we answer that there are no two ways of it there is only one way in which communism can be established equitably only one way which satisfies our instincts of justice and is at the same time practical namely the system already adopted by the agrarian communes of europe take for example a peasant commune no matter where even in france where the jacobins have done their best to destroy all communal usage if the commune possesses woods and copses then so long as there is plenty wood for all every one can take as much as he wants without other let or hindrance than the public opinion of his neighbours as to the timber trees which are always scarce they have to be carefully apportioned the same with the communal pasture land and while there is enough and to spare no limit is to put on what the cattle of each homestead may consume nor to the number of beasts grazing upon the pastures grazing grounds are not divided nor is the fodder doled out unless there is scarcity all the swiss communes and many of those in france and germany too wherever there is communal pasture land practice this system and in the countries of eastern europe where there are great forests and no scarcity of land you find the peasants felling the trees as they need them and cultivating as much as the soil as they require without any thought of limiting each man's share of timber or of land but the timber will be divided and the land parcelled out to each household according to its needs as soon as either becomes scarce as is already the case in russia in a word the system is this no stint or limit to what the community possesses in abundance but equal sharing and dividing of those commodities which are scarce or apt to run short of the three hundred and fifty millions who inhabit europe two hundred millions still follow the system of natural communism it is a fact worth remarking that the same system prevails in the great towns in the distribution of one commodity at least which is found in abundance the water is supplied to each house as long as there is no fear of the supply running short no water company thinks of checking the consumption of the water in each house take what you please but during the great droughts if there is any fear of supply failing the water companies know that all they have to do is to make known the fact by means of a short advertisement in the papers and the citizens will reduce their consumption of water and not let it run to waste but if the water were actually scarce what would be done recourse would be had in a system of rations such a measure is so natural so inherent in common sense that paris twice asked to be put on rations during the two sieges which it underwent in eighteen seventy one is it necessary to go into details to prepare tables showing how the distribution of rations may work to prove that it is just and equitable infinitely more just and equitable than an existing state of things all these tables and details will not serve to convince those of the middle classes nor alas those of the workers tainted with middle-class prejudices who regard the people as a mob of savages ready to fall upon and devour each other directly the government ceases to direct affairs but those only who have never seen the people resolve and act on their own initiative could doubt for a moment that if the masses were masters of the situation they would distribute rations to each and all in strictest accordance with justice and equity if you were to give utterance in any gathering of people to the opinion that delicacies game and such like should be reserved for the fastidious palates of aristocratic idlers and black bread given to the sick in the hospitals you would be hissed but say at the same gathering preach at the street corners and in the market-places that the most tempting delicacies ought to be kept for the sick and the feeble especially for the sick say that if there are only five brace of partridge in the entire city and only one case of sherry wine they should go to the sick people and the convalescents say that after the sick come the children for them 
the milk of the cows and goats should be reserved if there is not enough for all. To the children and the aged, the last piece of meat, and to the strong man, dry bread, if the community be reduced to that extremity. Say, in a word, that if this or that article of consumption runs short and has to be doled out, to those who have the most need, most should be given. Say that, and see if you do not meet with universal agreement. The man who is full-fed does not understand this, but the people do understand, and have always understood it. And even the child of luxury, if he is thrown on the street and comes into contact with the masses, even he will learn to understand. The theorists, for whom the soldier's uniform and the barrack mess table are civilization's last word, would like, no doubt, to start a regime of national kitchens and Spartan broth. They would point out the advantages thereby gained, the economy in fuel and food, if such huge kitchens were established, where every one could come for their rations of soup and bread and vegetables. We do not question these advantages. We are well aware that important economies have already been achieved in this direction, as, for instance, when the handmill or quern and the baker's oven attached to each house were abandoned. We can see perfectly well that it would be more economical to cook broth for a hundred families at once instead of lighting a hundred separate fires. We know, besides, that there are a thousand ways of doing up potatoes, but that cooked in one huge pot for a hundred families, they would be just as good. We know, in fact, that variety in cooking, being a matter of the seasoning introduced by each cook or housewife, the cooking together of a hundred weight of potatoes would not prevent each cook or housewife from dressing and serving them in any way she pleased. And we know that stock made from meat can be converted into a hundred different soups to suit a hundred different tastes. But though we are quite aware of these facts, we still maintain that no one has a right to force the housewife to take her potatoes from the communal kitchen ready cooked if she prefers to cook them herself in her own pot on her own fire. And, above all, we should wish that each one to be free to take his meals with his family or with his friends or even in a restaurant if so it seemed good to him. Naturally, large public kitchens will spring up to take the place of the restaurants where people are poisoned nowadays. Already the Parisian housewife gets the stock for her soup from the butcher and transforms it into whatever soup she likes, and the London housekeepers know that they can have a joint roasted, or an apple, or rhubarb tart baked at the baker's for a trifling sum, thus economizing time and fuel. And when the communal kitchen, the common bakehouse of the future, is established, and the people can get their food cooked without the risk of being cheated or poisoned, the custom will no doubt become general of going to the communal kitchen for the fundamental parts of the meal, leaving the last touches to be added as individual taste shall suggest. But to make a hard and fast rule of this, to make a duty of taking home our food ready cooked, that would be as repugnant to our modern minds as the ideas of the covent of the barrack, morbid ideas born in brains warped by tyranny of superstition. Who will have the right to the food of the commune will assuredly be the first question which we shall have to ask ourselves. Every township will answer for itself, and we are convinced that the answers will all be dictated by the sentiment of justice. Until labor is reorganized, as long as the disturbed period lasts, and while it is impossible to distinguish between inveterate idlers and genuine workers thrown out of work, the available food ought to be shared by all without exception. Those who have been enemies to the new order will hasten of their own accord to rid the commune of their presence. But it seems to us that the masses of the people, which have always been magnanimous and have nothing of vindictiveness in their disposition, will be ready to share their bread with all who remain with them, conquered and conquerors alike. It will be no loss to the revolution to be inspired by such an idea, and, when the work is set a-going again, the antagonists of yesterday will stand side by side in the same workshops. A society where work is free will have nothing to fear from idlers. But provisions will run short in a month, our critics at once exclaim. So much the better, say we. It will prove that for the first time on record, the people have had enough to eat. As to the question of obtaining fresh supplies, we shall discuss the means in our next chapter. End of chapter 5 The Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin Read by members of Audible Anarchist
Chapter 6 of The Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 6 Dwellings Those who have closely watched the growth of certain ideas among the workers must have noticed that on one momentous question, the housing of the people, namely, a definite conclusion is being imperceptibly arrived at. It is a known fact that in the large towns of France, and in many of the smaller ones also, the workers are coming gradually to the conclusion that dwelling houses are in no sense the property of those whom the state recognizes as their owners. This idea has evolved naturally in the minds of the people, and nothing will ever convince them again that the, quote, rights of property ought to extend to houses. The house was not built by its owner. It was erected, decorated, and furnished by innumerable workers in the timber yard, the brick field, and the workshop, toiling for dear life at a minimum wage. The money spent by the owner was not the product of his own toil. It was amassed, like all other riches, by paying the workers two-thirds or only half of what was their due. Moreover, and it is here that the enormity of the whole proceeding becomes most glaring, the house owes its actual value to the profit which the owner can make out of it. Now this profit results from the fact that his house is built in a town possessing bridges, quays, and fine public buildings, and affording to its inhabitants a thousand comforts and conveniences unknown in villages, a town well paved, lighted with gas, in regular communication with other towns, and itself a center of industry, commerce, science, and art a town which the work of twenty or thirty generations has gone to render habitable, healthy, and beautiful. A house in certain parts of Paris may be valued at thousands of pounds sterling, not because thousands of pounds worth of labor have been expended on that particular house, but because it is in Paris, because for centuries workmen, artists, thinkers, and men of learning and letters have contributed to make Paris what it is today a center of industry, commerce, politics, art, and science. Because Paris has a past, because thanks to literature the names of its streets are household words in foreign countries as well as at home, because it is the fruit of eighteen centuries of toil, the work of fifty generations of the whole French nation. Who then can appropriate to himself the tiniest plot of ground or the meanest building without committing a flagrant injustice? Who then has the right to sell to any bidder the smallest portion of the common heritage? On that point, as we have said, the workers are agreed. The idea of free dwellings showed its existence very plainly during the siege of Paris, when the cry was for an abatement pure and simple of the terms demanded by the landlords. It appeared again during the Commune of 1871, when the Paris workmen expected the communal council to decide boldly on the abolition of rent. And when the new revolution comes, it will be the first question with which the poor will concern themselves. Whether in time of revolution or in time of peace, the worker must be housed somehow or other. He must have some sort of roof over his head. But, however tumble down and squalid your dwelling may be, there is always a landlord who can evict you. True, during the revolution he cannot find bailiffs and police sergeants to throw your rags and chattels into the street, but who knows what the new government will do tomorrow? Who can say that it will not call in the aid of force again, and set the police back upon you to hound you out of your hovels? We have seen the commune proclaim the remission of rents due up to the 1st of April only. After that, rent had to be paid, though Paris was in a state of chaos and industry at a standstill, so that the revolutionist had absolutely nothing to depend upon but his allowance of fifteen pence a day. Now the worker must be made to see clearly that in refusing to pay rent to a landlord or owner, he is not simply profiting by the disorganization of authority. He must understand that the abolition of rent is a recognized principle, sanctioned, so to speak, by popular assent that to be housed rent-free is a right proclaimed aloud by the people. Are we going to wait till this measure, which is in harmony with every honest man's sense of justice, is taken up by the few socialists scattered among the middle-class elements, 
of which the provisionary government will be composed, we should have to wait long till the return of reaction, in fact. This is why, refusing uniforms and badges, those outward signs of authority and servitude and remaining people among the people, the earnest revolutionists will work side by side with the masses, that the abolition of rent, the expropriation of houses, may become an accomplished fact. They will prepare the ground and encourage ideas to grow in this direction, and when the fruit of their labors is ripe, the people will proceed to expropriate the houses without giving heed to the theories which will certainly be thrust in their way. Theories about paying compensation to landlords and finding first the necessary funds. On the day that the expropriation of houses takes place, on that day the exploited workers will have realized that the new times have come, that labor will no longer have to bear the yoke of the rich and powerful, that equality has been openly proclaimed, that this revolution is a real fact and not a theatrical make-believe like so many others preceding it. If the idea of expropriation be adopted by the people, it will be carried into effect in spite of all the, quote, insurmountable obstacles with which we are menaced. Of course, the good folk in new uniforms, seated in the official armchairs of the Hotel de Ville, will be sure to busy themselves in heaping up obstacles. They will talk of giving compensation to the landlords, of preparing statistics, and drawing up long reports. Yes, they would be capable of drawing up reports long enough to outlast the hopes of the people, who, after waiting and starving and enforced idleness and seeing nothing come of all these official researches, would lose heart and faith in the revolution and abandon the field to the reactionaries. The new bureaucracy would end by making expropriation hateful in the eyes of all. Here indeed is a rock which might shipwreck our hopes. But if the people turn a deaf ear to the specious arguments used to dazzle them, and realize that new life needs new conditions, and if they undertake the task themselves, then expropriation can be effected without any great difficulty. But how? How can it be done, you ask us? We shall try to reply to this question, but with a reservation. We have no intention of tracing out the plans of expropriation in their smallest details. We know beforehand that all that any man or group of men could suggest today would be far surpassed by the reality when it comes. Man will accomplish greater things and accomplish them better and by simpler methods than those dictated to him beforehand. Thus we are content to indicate the manner by which expropriation might be accomplished without the intervention of government. We do not propose to go out of our way to answer those who declare that the thing is impossible. We confine ourselves to replying that we are not the upholders of any particular method of organization. We are only concerned to demonstrate that expropriation could be effected by popular initiative and could not be effected by any other means whatever. It seems very likely that, as soon as expropriation is fairly stated, groups of volunteers will spring up in every district, street, and block of houses and undertake to inquire into the number of flats and houses which are empty and of those which are overcrowded, the unwholesome slums and the houses which are too spacious for their occupants and might well be used to house those who are stifled in swarming tenements. In a few days these volunteers would have drawn up complete lists for the streets and district of all the flats, tenements, family mansions, and villa residences all the rooms and suites of rooms, healthy and unhealthy, small and large, fetid dens and homes of luxury. Freely communicating with each other, these volunteers would soon have their statistics complete. False statistics can be manufactured in boardrooms and offices, but true and exact statistics must begin with the individual and mount up from the simple to the complex. Then, without waiting for anyone's leave, those citizens will probably go and find their comrades who are living in miserable garrets and hovels and will say to them simply, quote, It is a real revolution this time, comrades, and no mistake about it. Come to such a place this evening. All the neighborhood will be there. We are going to redistribute the dwelling houses. If you are tired of your slum garret, come and choose one of the flats of five rooms that are to be disposed of, and when you have once moved in, you shall stay, never fear. The people are up in arms and he who would venture to evict you will have to answer to them. 
but every one will want a fine house or a spacious flat we are told no you are mistaken it is not the people's way to clamor for the moon on the contrary every time we have seen them set about repairing a wrong we have been struck by the good sense and instinct for justice which animates the masses have we ever known them to demand the impossible have we ever seen the people of paris fighting amongst themselves while waiting for their rations of bread or firewood during the two sieges the patience and resignation which prevailed among them was constantly held up to admiration by the foreign press correspondents and yet these patient waiters knew full well that the last comers would have to pass the day without food or fire we do not deny that there are plenty of egotistic instincts and isolated individuals in our societies. We are quite aware of it. But we contend that the very way to revive and nourish these instincts would be to confine such questions as the housing of the people to any board or committee, in fact, to the tender mercies of officialism in any shape or form. Then, indeed, all the evil passions spring up, and it becomes a case of who is the most influential person on the board. The least inequality causes wranglings and recriminations. If the smallest advantage is given to any one, a tremendous hue and cry is raised, and not without reason. But if the people themselves, organized by streets, districts, and parishes, undertake to move the inhabitants of the slums into the half-empty dwellings of the middle classes, the trifling inconveniences, the little inequalities, will be easily tided over. Rarely has appeal been made to the good instincts of the masses, only as a last resort to save the sinking ship in times of revolution, but never has such an appeal been made in vain. The heroism, the self-devotion of the toiler has never failed to respond to it, and thus it will be in the coming revolution. But when all is said and done, some inequalities, some inevitable injustices will remain. There are individuals in our societies whom no great crisis can lift out of the deep ruts of egoism in which they are sunk. The question, however, is not whether there will be injustices or no, but rather how to limit the number of them. Now all history, all the experience of the human race, and all social psychology unite in showing that the best and fairest way is to trust the decision to those whom it concerns most nearly. It is they alone who can consider and allow for the hundred and one details which must necessarily be overlooked in any merely official redistribution. Moreover, it is by no means necessary to make straight away an absolutely equal redistribution of the dwellings. There will no doubt be some inconveniences at first, but matters will soon be righted in a society which has adopted expropriation. When the masons and carpenters and all who are concerned in house-building know that their daily bread is secured to them, they will ask nothing better than to work at their old trades a few hours a day. They will adapt the fine houses, which absorb the time of a whole staff of servants, and in a few months homes will have sprung up, infinitely healthier and more conveniently arranged than those of today. And to those who are not yet comfortably housed, the anarchist commune will be able to say, Patience, comrades, palaces fairer and finer than any the capitalists built for themselves will spring from the ground of our enfranchised city. They will belong to those who have most need of them. The anarchist commune does not build with an eye to revenues. These monuments erected to its citizens, products of the collective spirit, will serve as models to all humanity. They will be yours. If the people of the revolution expropriate the houses, and proclaim free lodgings, the communalizing of houses and the right of each family to a decent dwelling, then the revolution will have assumed a communistic character from the first, and started on a course from which it will be by no means easy to turn it. It will have struck a fatal blow at individual property. For the expropriation of dwellings contains in germ the whole social revolution. On the manner of its accomplishments depends the character of all that follows. Either we shall start on a good road, leading straight to anarchist communism, or we shall remain sticking in the mud of despotic individualism. It is easy to see the numerous objections, theoretic on the one hand, practical on the other, with which we are sure to be met. 
as it will be a question of maintaining iniquity at any price, our opponents will of course protest, quote, in the name of justice. Is it not a crying shame, they will exclaim, that the people of Paris should take possession of all these fine houses, while the peasants in the country have only tumble-down huts to live in? But do not let us make a mistake. These enthusiasts for justice forget, by lapse of memory to which they are subject, the crying shame which they themselves are tacitly defending. They forget that in this same city the worker, with his wife and children, suffocates in a noisome garret, while from his window he sees the rich man's palace. They forget that whole generations perish in crowded slums, starving for air and sunlight, and that to redress this injustice ought to be the first task of the revolution. Do not let these disingenuous protests hold us back. We know that any inequality which may exist between town and country in the early days of the revolution will be transitory and of a nature to right itself from day to day. For the village will not fail to improve its dwellings as soon as the peasant has ceased to be the beast of burden of the farmer, the merchant, the money lender, and the state. In order to avoid an accidental and transitory inequality, shall we stay our hand from righting an ancient wrong? The so-called practical objections are not very formidable either. We are bidden to consider the hard case of some poor fellow who by dint of privation has contrived to buy a house just large enough to hold his family. And we are going to deprive him of his hard-earned happiness, to turn him into the street. Certainly not. If his house is only just large enough for his family, by all means let him stay there. Let him work in his little garden too. Our boys will not hinder him, nay, they will lend him a helping hand if need be. But suppose he lets lodgings, suppose he has empty rooms in his house, then the people will make the lodger understand that he need not pay his former landlord any more rent. Stay where you are, but rent free. No more duns and collectors. Socialism has abolished all that. Or again, suppose that the landlord has a score of rooms all to himself, and some poor woman lives nearby with five children in one room. In that case, the people would see whether, with some alterations, these empty rooms could not be converted into a suitable home for the poor woman and her five children. Would not that be more just and fair than to leave the mother and her five little ones languishing in a garret, while Sir Gorgeous Midas sat at his ease in an empty mansion, Besides, good Sir Gorgeous would probably hasten to do it of his own accord. His wife will be delighted to be freed from half her big, unwieldy house when there is no longer a staff of servants to keep it in order. So you are going to turn everything upside down, say the defenders of law and order. There will be no end to the evictions and removals. Would it not be better to start fresh by turning everybody out of doors and redistributing the houses by lot? Thus our critics... But we are firmly persuaded that if no government interferes in the matter, if all the changes are entrusted to those free groups which have sprung up to undertake the work, the evictions and removals will be less numerous than those which take place in one year under the present system, owing to the rapacity of landlords. In the first place there are in all large towns almost enough empty houses and flats to lodge all the inhabitants of the slums. As to the palaces and suites of fine apartments, Many working people would not live in them if they could. One could not keep up such houses without a large staff of servants. Their occupants would soon find themselves forced to seek less luxurious dwellings. The fine ladies would find that palaces were not well adapted to self-help in the kitchen. Gradually, people would shake down. There would be no need to conduct Dives to a garret at the bayonet's point, or install Lazarus in Dive's palace by the help of an armed escort. People would shake down amicably into the available dwellings with the least possible friction and disturbance. Have we not the example of the village communes redistributing fields and disturbing the owners of the allotments so little that one can only praise the intelligence and good sense of the methods they employ? Fewer fields change hands under the management of the Russian commune than where personal property holds sway, and is forever carrying its quarrels into courts of law. And are we to believe that the inhabitants of a great European city would be less intelligent and less capable of organization than Russian or Hindu peasants? Moreover, we must not blink the fact 
that every revolution means a certain disturbance to everyday life, and those who expect this tremendous lift out of the old grooves to be accomplished without so much as jarring the dishes on their dinner tables will find themselves mistaken. It is true that governments can change without disturbing worthy citizens at dinner, but the crimes of society toward those who have nourished and supported it are not to be redressed by any such political slight of parties. Undoubtedly there will be a disturbance, but it must not be of pure destruction. It must be minimized. And again, it is impossible to lay too much stress on this maxim. It will be by addressing ourselves to the interested parties, and not to boards and committees, that we shall best succeed in reducing the sum of inconveniences for everybody. The people commit blunder on blunder when they have to choose by ballot some hare-brained candidate who solicits the honor of representing them and takes upon himself to know all, to do all, and to organize all. But when they take upon themselves to organize what they know, what touches them directly, they do it better than all the talking shops put together. Is not the Paris Commune even instance in point, and the great dockers strike, and have we not constant evidence of this fact in every village commune? End of chapter 6 The Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin Read by members of Audible Anarchist Chapter 7 of The Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 7. Clothing When the houses have become the common heritage of the citizens, and when each man has his daily supply of food, another forward step will have to be taken. The question of clothing will of course demand consideration next, and again the only possible solution will be to take possession, in the name of the people, of all the shops and warehouses where clothing is sold or stored and to throw open the doors to all, so that each can take what he needs. The communalization of clothing, the right of each to take what he needs from the communal stores, or to have it made for him at the tailors and outfitters, is a necessary corollary of the communalization of houses and food. Obviously, we shall not need for that to despoil all citizens of their coats, to put all the garments in a heap and draw lots for them, as our critics, with equal wit and ingenuity, suggest. Let him who has a coat keep it still, nay, if he have ten coats, it is highly improbable that any one will want to deprive him of them. For most folk would prefer a new coat to one that has already graced the shoulders of some fat bourgeois. And there will be enough new garments and to spare without having recourse to second-hand wardrobes. If we were to take an inventory of all the clothes and stuff for clothing accumulated in the shops and stores of the large towns, we should find probably that in Paris, Lyon, Bordeaux, and Marseille, there was enough to enable the commune to offer garments to all the citizens of both sexes, and if all were not suited at once, the communal outfitters would soon make good these shortcomings. We know how rapidly our great tailoring and dressmaking establishments work nowadays, provided as they are with machinery specially adapted for production on a large scale. But everyone will want a sable-lined coat or a velvet gown, exclaim our adversaries. Frankly, we do not believe it. Every woman does not dote on velvet, nor does every man dream of sable linings. Even now, if we were to ask each woman to choose her gown, we should find some to prefer a simple practical garment to all the fantastic trimmings the fashionable world affects. Tastes change with the times, and the fashion in vogue at the time of the revolution will certainly make for simplicity. Societies like individuals have their hours of cowardice, but also their heroic moments. And though the society of today cuts a very poor figure sunk in the pursuit of narrow personal interests and second-rate ideas, it wears a different air when great crises come. It has its moments of greatness and enthusiasm. Men of a generous nature will gain the power which today is in the hand of jobbers. Self-devotion will spring up, and noble deeds beget their like. Even the egotists will be ashamed of hanging back, and will be drawn in spite of themselves to admire, if not to imitate, the generous and brave. The Great Revolution of 1793 abounds in examples of this kind, and it is ever during such times of spiritual revival, as nature to societies as to individuals, that the springtide of enthusiasm sweeps humanity onwards. 
We do not wish to exaggerate the part played by such noble passions, nor is it upon them that we would found our ideal society. But we are not asking too much if we expect their aid in tiding over the first and most difficult moments. We cannot hope that our daily life will be continuously inspired by such exalted enthusiasms, but we may expect their aid at the first, and that is all we need. It is just to wash the earth clean, to sweep away the shards and refuse, accumulated by centuries of slavery and oppression, that the new anarchist society will have need of this wave of brotherly love. Later on, it can exist without appealing to the spirit of self-sacrifice, because it will have eliminated oppression, and thus created a new world instinct with all the feelings of solidarity. Besides, should the character of the revolution be such as we have sketched here, the free initiative of individuals would find an extensive field of action in thwarting the efforts of the egotists. Groups would spring up in every street and quarter to undertake the charge of the clothing. They would make inventories of all that the city possessed and would find out approximately what were the resources at their disposal. It is more than likely that in the matter of clothing the citizens would adopt the same principle as in the matter of provisions. That is to say, they would offer freely from the common store everything which was to be found in abundance and dole out whatever was limited in quantity. Not being able to offer to each man a sable-lined coat and to every woman a velvet gown, society would probably distinguish between the superfluous and the necessary, and, provisionally at least, class sable and velvet among the superfluities of life, ready to let time prove whether what is a luxury today may not become common to all tomorrow. While the necessary clothing would be guaranteed to each inhabitant of the anarchist city, it would be left to private activity to provide for the sick and feeble those things provisionally considered as luxuries and to procure for the less robust such special articles, as would not enter into the daily consumption of ordinary citizens. But, it may be urged, this gray uniformity means the end of everything beautiful in life and art. Certainly not, we reply, and we still base our opinion on what already exists. We propose to show presently how an anarchist society could satisfy the most artistic tastes of its citizens without allowing them to amass the fortunes of millionaires. End of chapter 7 The Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin Read by members of Audible Anarchist Chapter 8 of The Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 8 Ways and Means Part 1 If a society, a city, or a territory were to guarantee the necessaries of life to its inhabitants, and we shall see how the conception of the necessaries of life can be so extended as to include luxuries, it would be compelled to take possession of what is absolutely needed for production, that is to say, land, machinery, factories, means of transport, etc. Capital in the hands of private owners would be expropriated and returned to the community. The great harm done by bourgeois society, as we have already mentioned, is not only that capitalists seize a large share of the profits of each industrial and commercial enterprise, thus enabling them to live without working, but that all production has taken a wrong direction, as it is not carried on with a view to securing well-being to all. For this reason, we condemn it. Moreover, it is impossible to carry on mercantile production in everybody's interest. To wish it would be to expect the capitalist to go beyond his province and to fulfill duties that he cannot fulfill without ceasing to be what he is, a private manufacturer seeking his own enrichment. Capitalist organization, based on the personal interest of each individual trader, has given all that could be expected of it to society. It has increased the productive force of work. The capitalist, profiting by the revolution affected in industry by steam, by the sudden development of chemistry and machinery, and by other inventions of our century, has endeavored in his own interest to increase the yield of work, and in a great measure he has succeeded. But to attribute other duties to him would be unreasonable. For example, to expect that he should use the superior yield of work in the interests of society as a whole would be to ask philanthropy and charity of him, and capitalist enterprise cannot be based on charity. It now remains for society to extend this greater productivity, which is limited to certain industries, and to apply it to the general good. But it is evident that to guarantee well-being to all, society must take back possession of all means of production. Economists, as is their wont, will not fail to remind us of the comparative well-being of a certain category of young, robust workmen, skilled in certain special branches of industry. 
It is always this minority that is pointed out to us with pride. But is this well-being, which is the exclusive right of a few, secure? Tomorrow, maybe, negligence, improvidence, or the greed of their employers will deprive these privileged men of their work, and they will pay for the period of comfort they have enjoyed with months and years of poverty or destitution. How many important industries, woven goods, iron, sugar, etc., without mentioning short-lived trades, have we not seen decline or come to a standstill alternately on account of speculations, or in consequence of natural displacement of work, and lastly, from the effects of competition due to capitalists themselves? If the chief weaving and mechanical industries had to pass through such a crisis as they have passed through in 1886, we hardly need mention the small trades, all of which come periodically to a standstill. What, too, shall we say to the price which is paid for the relative well-being of certain categories of workmen? Unfortunately, it is paid for by the ruin of agriculture, the shameless exploitation of peasants, the misery of the masses. In comparison with the feeble minority of workers who enjoy a certain comfort, how many millions of human beings live from hand to mouth without a secure wage, ready to go wherever they are wanted? How many peasants work 14 hours a day for a poor pittance? Capital depopulates the country, exploits the colonies and the countries where industries are but little developed, dooms the immense majority of workmen to remain without technical education, to remain mediocre, even in their own trade. This is not merely accidental, it is a necessity of the capitalist system. In order to remunerate certain classes of workmen, peasants must become the beasts of burden of society. The country must be deserted for the town. Small trades must agglomerate in the foul suburbs of large cities, and manufacture a thousand things of little value for next to nothing, so as to bring the goods of the greater industries within reach of buyers with small salaries. That bad cloth may sell. Garments are made for ill-paid workers by tailors who are satisfied with a starvation wage. Eastern lands, in a backward state, are exploited by the West, in order that, under the capitalist system, workers in a few privileged industries may obtain certain limited comforts of life. The evil of the present system is therefore not that the surplus value of production goes to the capitalist, as Robertus and Marx said, thus narrowing the socialist conception and the general view of the capitalist system. The surplus value itself is but a consequence of deeper causes. The evil lies in the possibility of a surplus value existing, instead of a simple surplus not consumed by each generation. For, that a surplus value should exist, means that men, women, and children are compelled by hunger to sell their labor for a small part of what this labor produces, and, above all, of what their labor is capable of producing. But this evil will last as long as the instruments of production belong to a few. As long as men are compelled to pay tribute to property holders for the right of cultivating land or putting machinery into action, and the property holder is free to produce what bids fair to bring him in the greatest profits, rather than the greatest amount of useful commodities, well-being can only be temporarily guaranteed to a very few, and is only to be bought by the poverty of a section of society. It is not sufficient to distribute the profits realized by a trade in equal parts. If, at the same time, thousands of other workers are exploited, it is a case of producing the greatest amount of goods necessary to the well-being of all with the least possible waste of human energy. This cannot be the aim of a private owner, and this is why society as a whole taking this view of production as its ideal, will be compelled to expropriate all that enhances well-being while producing wealth. It will have to take possession of land, factories, mines, means of communication, etc. And besides, it will have to study what products will promote general well-being, as well as the ways and means of production. Part 2. How many hours a day will man have to work to produce nourishing food, a comfortable home, and necessary clothing for his family? The question has often preoccupied socialists, and they generally came to the conclusion that four or five hours a day would suffice, on condition, be it well understood, that all men work. At the end of last century, Benjamin Franklin fixed the limit at five hours, and if the need of comfort is greater now, the power of production has augmented too, and far more rapidly. In speaking of agriculture further on, we shall see what the earth can be made to yield to man when he cultivates it scientifically, instead of throwing seed haphazard in a badly plowed soil as he mostly does today. In the great farms of Western America, some of which cover 30 square miles, but have a poorer soil than the manured soil of civilized countries, only 10 to 15 English bushels per English acre are obtained, that is to say, half the yield of European farms or of American farms in eastern states. And nevertheless, thanks to machines which enable two men to plow four English acres a day, 
100 men can produce in a year, all that is necessary to deliver the bread of 10,000 people at their homes during a whole year. Thus, it would suffice for a man to work under the same conditions for 30 hours, say six half days of five hours each, to have bread for a whole year, and to work 30 half days to guarantee the same to a family of five people. We shall also prove by results obtained nowadays that if we had recourse to intensive agriculture, less than six half days work could procure bread, meat, vegetables, and even luxurious fruit for a whole family. And again, if we study the cost of workmen's dwellings, built in large towns today, we can ascertain that to obtain, in a large English city, a detached little house, as they are built for workmen, from 1400 to 1800, half day's work of five hours would be sufficient. As a house of that kind lasts 50 years at least, it follows that 28 to 36 half day's work a year could provide well-furnished, healthy quarters with all necessary comfort for a family. Whereas when hiring the same apartment from an employer, a workman pays 75 to 100 day's work per year. Mark that these figures represent the maximum of what a house costs in England today, being given the defective organization of our societies. In Belgium, workmen cities have been built far cheaper. Taking everything into consideration, we are justified in affirming that in a well-organized society, 30 or 40 half days work a year will suffice to guarantee a perfectly comfortable home. There now remains clothing, the exact value of which is almost impossible to fix because the profits realized by a swarm of middlemen cannot be estimated. Let us take cloth, for example, and add up all the deductions made by landowners, sheep owners, wool merchants, and all their intermediate agents, then by railway companies, mill owners, weavers, dealers in ready-made clothes, sellers and commission agents, and you will get an idea of what is paid to a whole swarm of capitalists for each article of clothing. That is why it is perfectly impossible to say how many days work an overcoat that you pay three or four pounds in a large London shop represents. What is certain is that with present machinery, they no doubt manage to manufacture an incredible amount of goods. A few examples will suffice. Thus, in the United States, in 751 cotton mills for spinning and weaving, 175,000 men and women produce 2,033,000,000 yards of cotton goods. Besides a great quantity of thread, on the average, more than 12,000 yards of cotton goods alone are obtained by a 300 days work of 9.5 hours each, say 40 yards of cotton in 10 hours. Admitting that a family needs 200 yards a year at most, this would be equivalent to 50 hours work, say 10 half days of 5 hours each, and we should have thread besides, that is to say, cotton to sew with, and thread to weave cloth with, so as to manufacture woolen stuffs mixed with cotton. As to the results obtained by weaving alone, the official statistics of the United States teach us that in 1870, if workmen worked 13 to 14 hours a day, they made 10,000 yards of white cotton goods in a year. Thirteen years later, in 1886, they wove 30,000 yards by working only 55 hours a week. Even in printed cotton goods they obtained, weaving and printing included 32,000 yards in 2,670 hours of work a year, say, about 12 yards an hour. Thus, to have your 200 yards of white printed cotton goods 17 hours of work a year would suffice. It is necessary to remark that raw material reaches these factories in about the same state as it comes from the fields, and that the transformations gone through by the piece before it is converted into goods are completed in the course of these 17 hours. But to buy these 200 yards from the tradesmen, a well-paid workman must give at the very least 10 to 15 days work of 10 hours each, say 100 to 150 hours. Find as to the English peasant, he would have to toil for a month or a little more to obtain this luxury. By this example, we already see that by working 50 half days per year in a well-organized society, we could dress better than the lower middle classes today. But with all this, we have only required 60 half days work of five hours each to obtain the fruits of the earth, 40 for housing and 50 for clothing, which only makes half a year's work as the year consists of 300 working days if we deduct holidays there remains still 150 half days work which could be made use of for other necessaries of life, wine, sugar, coffee, tea, furniture, transport, etc., etc. It is evident that these calculations are only approximate, but they can also be proved in another way. When we take into account how many in the so-called civilized nations produce nothing, how many work at harmful trades, doomed to disappear, and lastly, how many are useless middlemen, we see that in each nation the number of real producers could be doubled. And if, instead of every 10 men, 
20 were occupied in producing useful commodities, and if society took the trouble to economize human energy, those 20 people would only have to work 5 hours a day without production decreasing, and it would suffice to reduce the waste of human energy at the service of wealthy families or of those administrations that have one official to every 10 inhabitants, and to utilize those forces to augment the productivity of the nation, to limit work to 4 or even to 3 hours on the condition that we should be satisfied with present production. After studying all these facts together, we may arrive then at the following conclusion. Imagine a society comprising a few million inhabitants engaged in agriculture and a great variety of industries. Paris, for example, with the department of saint -Ewas. Suppose that in this society all children learn to work with their hands as well as with their brains. Admit that all adults, save women, engaged in the education of their children, bind themselves to work 5 hours a day from the age of 20 or 22 to 45 or 50 and they follow occupations they have chosen in any one branch of human work considered necessary. Such a society could in return guarantee well-being to all its members, that is to say, a more substantial well-being than that enjoyed today by the middle classes. And, moreover, each worker belonging to this society would have at his disposal at least five hours a day which he could devote to science, art, and individual needs which do not come under the category of necessities, but will probably do so later on, when men's productivity will have augmented and those objects will no longer appear luxurious or inaccessible. End of chapter 8 The Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin Read by members of Audible Anarchist Chapter 9 of The Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 9. The Need for Luxury Part 1. Man, however, is not a being whose exclusive purpose in life is eating, drinking, and providing a shelter for himself. As soon as his material wants are satisfied, other needs of an artistic character will thrust themselves forward the more ardently. Aims of life vary with each and every individual, and the more society is civilized, the more will individuality be developed, and the more will desires be varied. Even today, we see men and women denying themselves necessaries to acquire mere trifles, to obtain some particular gratification or some intellectual or material enjoyment. A Christian or an ascetic may disapprove of these desires for luxury but it is precisely these trifles that break the monotony of existence and make it agreeable. Would life, with all its inevitable sorrows, be worth living if, besides daily work, man could never obtain a single pleasure according to his individual tastes? If we wish for a social revolution, it is no doubt in the first place to give bread to all. To transform this execrable society, in which we can every day see robust workmen dangling their arms for want of an employer who will exploit them, women and children wandering shelterless at night, whole families reduced to dry bread, men, women, and children dying for want of care and even for want of food. It is to put an end to these iniquities that we rebel. But we expect more from the revolution. We see that the worker, compelled to struggle painfully for bare existence, is reduced to ignorance of these higher delights. The highest within man's reach, of science and especially of scientific discovery, of art and especially of artistic creation, it is in order to obtain these joys for all, which are now reserved to a few, in order to give leisure and the possibility of developing intellectual capacities, that the social revolution must guarantee daily bread to all. After bread has been secured, leisure is the supreme aim. No doubt, nowadays, when hundreds and thousands of human beings are in need of bread, coal, clothing, and shelter, luxury is a crime. To satisfy it, the worker's child must go without bread. But in a society in which all can eat sufficiently, the needs which we consider luxuries today will be the more keenly felt. And as all men do not and cannot resemble one another, the variety of tastes and needs is the chief guarantee of human progress, there will always be, and it is desirable that there should always be, men and women whose desire will go beyond those of ordinary individuals in some particular direction. Everybody does not need a telescope because, even if learning were general, there are people who prefer examining things through a microscope to studying the starry heavens. Some like statues, some pictures. A particular individual has no other ambition than to possess an excellent piano, while another is pleased with an accordion. The tastes vary, but the artistic needs exist in all. 
In our present poor capitalistic society, the man who has artistic needs cannot satisfy them unless he is an heir to a large fortune, or by dint of hard work appropriates to himself an intellectual capital which will enable him to take up a liberal profession. Still, he cherishes the hope of someday satisfying his tastes more or less, and for this reason he reproaches the idealist communist societies with having the material life of each individual as their sole aim. Quote, in your communal stores you may perhaps have bread for all, he says to us, but you will not have beautiful pictures, optical instruments, luxurious furniture, artistic jewelry, in short, the many things that minister to the infinite variety of human tastes. And in this way, you suppress the possibility of obtaining anything besides the bread and meat which the commune can offer to all, and the gray linen in which all your lady citizens will be dressed, end quote. These are the objections which all communist systems have to consider, in which the founders of new societies established in American deserts never understood. They believe that if the community could procure sufficient cloth to dress all its members, a music hall in which the brothers could strum a piece of music or act a play from time to time, it was enough. They forgot that the feeling of art existed in the agriculturalist as well as in the burger, and, notwithstanding that the expression of artistic feeling varies according to the difference in culture, in the main it remains the same. In vain did the community guarantee the common necessities of life. In vain did it suppress all education that would tend to develop individuality. In vain did it eliminate all reading save the Bible. Individual tastes broke forth and caused general discontent. Quarrels arose when somebody proposed to buy a piano or scientific instruments, and the elements of progress flagged. The society could only exist on condition that it crushed all individual feeling, all artistic tendency, and all development. Will the anarchist commune be impelled by the same direction? Evidently not, if it understands that while it produces all that is necessary to material life, it must also strive to satisfy all manifestations of the human mind. Part 2. We frankly confess that when we think of the abyss of poverty and suffering that surrounds us, when we hear the heart-rending cry of the worker walking the streets begging for work, we are loth to discuss the question, how will men act in a society whose members are properly fed to satisfy certain individuals desirous of possessing a piece of Sevres china or a velvet dress? We are tempted to answer, let us make sure of bread to begin with, we shall see to china and velvet later on. But as we recognize that man has other needs besides food, and as the strength of anarchy lies precisely in that it understands all human faculties and all passions and ignores none, we shall, in a few words, explain how man can contrive to satisfy all his intellectual and artistic needs. We have already mentioned that by working four or five hours a day till the age of 45 or 50, man could easily produce all that is necessary to guarantee comfort to society. But the day's work of a man accustomed to toil does not consist of hours. It is a 10 hours day for 300 days a year and lasts all his life. Of course, when a man is harnessed to a machine, his health is soon undermined and his intelligence is blunted. But when man has the possibility of varying occupations and especially of alternating manual with intellectual work, he can remain occupied without fatigue and even with pleasure for 10 or 12 hours a day. Consequently, the man who will have done four or five hours of manual work necessary for his existence will have before him five or six hours which he will seek to employ according to his tastes. And these five or six hours a day will fully enable him to procure for himself, if he associates with others, all he wishes for, in addition to the necessaries guaranteed to all. He will discharge first his task in the field, the factory, and so on, which he owes to society as his contribution to the general production and he will employ the second half of his day, his week, or his year to satisfy his artistic or scientific needs, or his hobbies. Thousands of societies will spring up to gratify every taste and every possible fancy. Some, for example, will give their hours of leisure to literature. They will then form groups comprising authors, compositors, printers, engravers, draftsmen, all pursuing a common aim, the propagation of ideas that are dear to them. Nowadays, an author knows that there is a beast of burden, the worker, to whom, for the sum of a few shillings a day, he can entrust the printing of his books. But he hardly cares to know what a printing office is like. If the compositor suffers from lead poisoning, and if the child who sees to the machine dies of anemia, are there not other poor wretches to replace them? But when there will be no more starvelings ready to sell their work for a pittance, when the exploited worker of today will be educated and will have his own ideas to put down in black and white and to communicate to others, then the authors and scientific men will be compelled to combine 
among themselves and with the printers in order to bring out their prose and their poetry. So long as men consider fustian and manual labor as a mark of inferiority, it will appear amazing to them to see an author setting up his own book in type. For has he not a gymnasium or games by way of diversion? But when the opprobrium connected with manual labor has disappeared, when all will have to work with their hands, there being no one to do it for them, then the authors as well as their admirers will soon learn the art of handling, composing sticks, and type. They will know the pleasure of coming together, all admirers of the work to be printed. To set up the type, to shape it into pages, to take it in its virginal purity from the press. These beautiful machines, instruments of torture to the child who attends on them from morn till night, will be a source of enjoyment for those who will make use of them in order to give voice to the thoughts of their favorite author. Will literature lose by it? Will the poet be less a poet after having worked out of doors or helped with his hands to multiply his work? Will the novelist lose his knowledge of human nature after having rubbed shoulders with other men in the forest or the factory, in the laying out of a road or on a railway line? Can there be two answers to these questions? Maybe some books will be less voluminous, but then more will be said on fewer pages. Maybe fewer waste sheets will be published, but the matter printed will be more attentively read and more appreciated. The book will appeal to a larger circle of better educated readers, who will be more competent to judge. Moreover, the art of printing that has so little progress since Gutenberg is still in its infancy. It takes two hours to compose and type what is written in ten minutes but more expeditious methods of multiplying thought are being sought after and will be discovered. What a pity every author does not have to take his share in the printing of his works. What progress printing would have already made. We should no longer be using the movable letters as in the 17th century. Part 3. Is it a dream to conceive a society in which, all having become producers, all having received an education that enables them to cultivate science or art, and all having leisure to do so, Men would combine to publish the works of their choice by contributing each his share of manual work? We have already hundreds of learned, literary, and other societies, and these societies are nothing but voluntary groups of men interested in certain branches of learning and associated for the purpose of publishing their works. The authors who write for the periodicals of these societies are not paid, and the periodicals are not for sale. They are sent gratis to all quarters of the globe, to other societies cultivating the same branches of learning. This member of the society may insert in its review a one-page note summarizing his observations. Another may publish therein an extensive work, the results of long years of study. While others will confine themselves to consulting the review as a starting point for further research, it does not matter. All these authors and readers are associated for the production of works in which all of them take an interest. It is true that a learned society, like the individual author, goes to a printing office where workmen are engaged to do the printing. Nowadays, those who belong to the learned societies despise manual labor, which indeed is carried on under very bad conditions. But a community which would give a generous, philosophic, and scientific education to all its members would know how to organize manual labor in such a way that it would be the pride of humanity. Its learned societies would become associations of explorers, lovers of science, and workers, all knowing a manual trade and all interested in science. If, for example, the society is studying geology, all will contribute to the exploration of the Earth's strata. Each member will take his share in research, and 10,000 observers, where we have now only 100, will do more in a year than we can do in 20 years. And when their works are to be published, 10,000 men and women skilled in different trades will be ready to draw maps, engrave designs, compose, and print the books. With gladness will they give their leisure, in summer to exploration, in winter to indoor work. And when their works appear, they will find not only a hundred, but ten thousand readers interested in their common work. This is the direction in which progress is already moving. Even today, when England felt the need of a complete dictionary of the English language, the birth of a littre, who would devote his life to this work, was not waited for. Volunteers were appealed to, and a thousand men offered their services, spontaneously and gratuitously, to ransack the libraries, to take notes, and to accomplish in a few years a work which one man could not complete in his lifetime. In all branches of human intelligence, the same spirit is breaking forth, and we should have a very limited knowledge of humanity could we not guess that the future is announcing itself in such tentative cooperation, which is gradually taking the place of individual work. For this dictionary to be a really collective work, it would have required that many volunteer authors, printers, and printers' readers should have worked in common. But something in this direction is done already in the socialist press, which offers us examples of manual and intellectual work combined. 
It happens in our newspapers that a socialist author composes in lead his own article. True, such attempts are rare, but they indicate in which direction evolution is going. They show the road of liberty. In future, when a man will have something useful to say, a word that goes beyond the thoughts of his century, he will not have to look for an editor who might advance the necessary capital. He will look for collaborators among those who know the printing trade and who approve the idea of his new work. Together, they will publish the new book or journal. Literature and journalism will cease to be a means of money-making and living at the cost of others. But is there anyone who knows literature and journalism from within, and who does not ardently desire that literature should at last be able to free itself from those who formerly protected it, and who now exploit it, and from the multitude which, with rare exceptions, pays it in proportion to its mediocrity, or to the ease with which it adapts itself to the bad taste of the greater number? Letters and science will only take their proper place in the work of human development when, freed from all mercenary bondage, they will be exclusively cultivated by those that love them and for those that love them. Part 4. Literature, science, and art must be cultivated by free men. Only on this condition will they succeed in emancipating themselves from the yoke of the state, of capital, and of the bourgeois mediocrity which stifles them. What means has the scientist of today to make researches that interest him? Should he ask help of the state, which can only be given to one candidate in a hundred, and which none may obtain who does not ostensibly promise to keep to the beaten track? Let us remember how the Institute of France censured Darwin, how the Academy of St. Petersburg treated Mendeleev with contempt, and how the Royal Society of London refused to publish Jules' paper, in which he determined the mechanical equivalent of heat, finding it unscientific. It is why all great researches, all discoveries revolutionizing science, have been made outside academies and universities, either by men rich enough to remain independent like Darwin and Lyell, or by men who undermine their health by working in poverty and often in great straits, losing no end of time for want of a laboratory, and unable to procure the instruments or books necessary to continue their researches, but persevering against hope and often dying before they had reached the end in view, their name is Legion. Altogether, the system of help granted by the state is so bad that science has always endeavored to emancipate itself from it. For this very reason, there are thousands of learned societies organized and maintained by volunteers in Europe and America, some having developed to such a degree that all the resources of subvention societies and the wealth of millionaires would not buy their treasures. No governmental institution is as rich as the Zoological Society of London, which is supported by voluntary contributions. It does not buy the animals which in thousands people its gardens. They are sent by other societies and by collectors of the entire world. The Zoological Society of Bombay will send an elephant as a gift. Another time a hippopotamus or a rhinoceros is offered by Egyptian naturalists. And these magnificent presents are pouring in every day, arriving from all quarters of the globe, birds, reptiles, collections of insects, etc. These consignments often comprise animals that could not be bought for all the gold in the world. Thus, a traveler who has captured an animal at life's peril, and now loves it as he would love a child, will give it to the society because he is sure it will be cared for. The entrance fee paid by visitors, and they are numberless, suffices for the maintenance of that immense institution. What is defective in the Zoological Society of London, and in other kindred societies, is that the member's fee cannot be paid in work. That the keepers and numerous employees of this large institution are not recognized as members of the society. While many have no other incentive to joining the society than to put the cabalistic letters FZS, Fellow of the Zoological Society, on their cards. In a word, what is needed is a more perfect cooperation. We may say the same about inventors that we have said of scientists. Who does not know what sufferings nearly all great inventions that have come to light have cost? Sleepless nights, families deprived of bread, want of tools and materials for experiments, is the history of nearly all those who have enriched industry with inventions which are the truly legitimate pride of our civilization. But what are we to do to alter conditions that everybody is convinced are bad? Patents have been tried, and we know with what results. The inventor sells his patent for a few shillings, and the man who has only lent the capital pockets the often enormous profits resulting from the invention. Besides, patents isolate the inventor. They compel him to keep secret his researches, which therefore end in failure, whereas the simplest suggestion, coming from a brain less absorbed in the fundamental idea, sometimes suffices to fertilize the invention and make it practical. Like all state control, patents hamper the progress of industry. Thought being incapable of being patented, patents are a crying injustice in theory, and in practice they result in one of the great obstacles to the rapid development of invention. 
What is needed to promote the spirit of invention is, first of all, the awakening of thought, the boldness of conception, which our entire education causes to languish. It is the spreading of a scientific education, which would increase the number of inquirers a hundredfold. It is faith that humanity is going to take a step forward. End of chapter 9 The Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin Read by members of Audible Anarchist Chapter 10 of The Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 10. Agreeable Work. Part 1. When socialists declare that a society emancipated from capital would make work agreeable and would suppress all repugnant and unhealthy drudgery, they get laughed at. And yet, even today, we see the striking progress made in this direction, and wherever this progress has been achieved, employers congratulate themselves on the economy of energy obtained thereby. It is evident that a factory could be made as healthy and pleasant as a scientific laboratory and it is no less evident that it would be advantageous to make it so. In a spacious and well-ventilated factory, work is better. It is easy to introduce small ameliorations, of which each represents an economy of time or of manual labor. And if most of the workshops we know are foul and unhealthy, it is because the workers are of no account in the organization of factories, and because the most absurd waste of human energy is its distinctive feature. Nevertheless, now and again, we find some factories so well managed that it would be a real pleasure to work in them if the work, be it well understood, were not to last more than four or five hours a day, and everyone had the possibility of varying it according to his tastes. Look at this factory, unfortunately consecrated to engines of war. It is perfect as far as regards sanitary and intelligent organization. It occupies 50 English acres of land, 15 of which are roofed with glass. The pavement of fireproof bricks is as clean as that of a miner's cottage, and the glass roof is carefully cleaned by a gang of workmen who do nothing else. In this factory are forged steel ingots, or blooms, weighing as much as 20 tons, and when you stand 30 feet from the immense furnace, whose flames have a temperature of more than a thousand degrees, you do not guess its presence, save when its great jaws open to let out a steel monster, and the monster is handled by only three or four workmen, who now here, now there, open a tap, causing immense cranes to move by pressure of water in the pipes. You enter expecting to hear the deafening noise of stampers, and you find that there are no stampers. The immense hundred-ton guns and the crankshafts of transatlantic steamers are forged by hydraulic pressure, and instead of forging steel, the worker has but to turn a tap to give it shape, which makes a far more homogeneous metal, without crack or flaw, of the blooms, whatever be their thickness. We expect an infernal grating, and we find machines which cut blocks of steel 30 feet long with no more noise than is needed to cut cheese. And when we expressed our admiration to the engineer who showed us round, he answered, It is a mere question of economy. This machine, the plain steel, has been in use for 42 years. It would not have lasted 10 years if its component parts, badly adjusted, lacking in cohesive strength, interfered and creaked at each movement of the plane. And the blast furnaces? It would be a waste to let the heat escape instead of utilizing it. Why roast the founders when heat lost by radiation represents tons of coal? The stampers that made the building shake five leagues off were also a waste. It is better to forge by pressure than by impact, and it costs less. There is less loss. In a factory, light, planningless, the space allotted to each bench is but of a simple question of economy. Work is better done when you can see and you have elbow room. It is true, he said. We are very cramped before coming here. Land is so expensive in the vicinity of large towns. Landlords are so grasping. It is even so in mines. We know what mines are like nowadays from Zola's descriptions and from newspaper reports. But the mine of the future will be well ventilated, with a temperature as easily regulated as that of a library. There will be no horses doomed to die below the earth. Underground traction will be carried on by a means of an automatic cable put in motion at the pit's mouth. Ventilators will always be working, 
and there will never be explosions. This is no dream. Such a mine is already to be seen in England. We went down it. Here again, this organization is simply a question of economy. The mine of which we speak, in spite of its immense depth, 466 yards, has an output of a thousand tons of coal a day, with only 200 miners, five tons a day per each worker, whereas the average of the 2,000 pits in England is hardly 300 tons a year per man. If necessary, we can multiply examples, proving that Fouillet's dream regarding material organization was not a utopia. This question has, however, been so frequently discussed in socialist newspapers that public opinion might have been educated. Factory, forge, and mine can be as healthy and magnificent as the finest laboratories in modern universities, and the better the organization, the more will man's labor produce. If it be so, can we doubt that work will become a pleasure and a relaxation in a society of equals, in which hands will not be compelled to sell themselves to toil? and to accept work under any conditions. Repugnant tasks will disappear because it is evident that these unhealthy conditions are harmful to a society as a whole. Slaves can submit to them, but free men will create new conditions, and their work will be pleasant and infinitely more productive. The exceptions of today will be the rule of tomorrow. The same will come to pass as regards domestic work, which today society lays on the shoulder of that drudge of humanity, woman. Part 2. A society regenerated by the revolution will make domestic slavery disappear. This last form of slavery, perhaps the most tenacious, because it is also the most ancient. Only, it will not come about in the way dreamt by the Phalisterians, nor in the manner often imagined by authoritarian communists. Phalisteries are repugnant to millions of human beings. The most reserved man certainly feels the necessity of meeting his fellows for the purpose of common work which becomes the more attractive the more he feels himself a part of an immense whole. But it is not so for the hours of leisure reserved for rest and intimacy. The phallistery and the familistery do not take this into account, or else they endeavor to supply its needs by artificial groupings. A phallistery, which is in fact nothing but an immense hotel, can please some, and even all, at a certain period of their life. But the great mass prefers family life, family life, of the future, be it understood. They prefer isolated apartments, Normans and Anglo-Saxons, even going as far as to prefer houses of from six to eight rooms, in which the family or an agglomeration of friends can live apart. Sometimes a phalanstery is a necessity, but it would be hateful were it the general rule. Isolation, alternating with time spent in society, is the normal desire of human nature. This is why one of the greatest tortures in prison is an impossibility of isolation, much as solitary confinement becomes torture in its turn when not alternated with hours of social life. As to considerations of economy, which are sometimes laid stress on in favor of balanced areas, they are those of a petty tradesman. The most important economy, the only reasonable one, is to make life pleasant for all, because the man who is satisfied with his life produces infinitely more than the man who curses his surroundings. Other socialists reject the phalanstery, but when you ask them how domestic work can be organized, they answer, Each can do his own work. My wife manages the house. The wives of the bourgeois will do as much. And if it is a bourgeois playing at socialism who speaks, he will add with a gracious smile to his wife, Is it not true, darling, that you would do without a servant in a socialist society? You would work like the wife of our good comrade Paul, or the wife of John the carpenter? Servant or wife, man always reckons on a woman to do the housework. But woman, too, at last claims her share in the emancipation of humanity. She no longer wants to be the beast of burden of the house. She considers it sufficient to work, to give many years of her life to the rearing of her children. She no longer wants to be the cook, the mender, the sweeper of the house. And owing to American women taking the lead in obtaining their claims, there is a general complaint of the dearth of woman who will condescend to domestic work in the United States. My lady prefers art, politics, literature, or the gaming tables. As to the work girls, there are few, those who consent to submit to apron slavery, and servants are only found with difficulty in the States. Consequently, the solution is a very simple one. It's pointed out by life itself. Machinery undertakes three quarters of the household cares. You black your boots, and you know how ridiculous this work is. What can be more stupid than rubbing a boot 20 or 30 times with a brush? 
a tenth of the European population must be compelled to sell itself in exchange for a miserable shelter and insufficient food, and a woman must consider herself a slave in order that millions of her sex should go through this performance every morning. But hairdressers already have machines for brushing glossy or woolly heads of hair. Why should we not apply, then, the same principle to the other extremity? So it has not been done, and nowadays the machine for blacking boots is in the general use in big American and European hotels. Its use is spreading outside hotels. In large English schools, where the pupils are boarding in the houses of the teachers, it has been found easier to have one single establishment which undertakes to brush a thousand pairs of boots every morning. As to washing up, where can we find a housewife who has not a horror of a long and dirty work that is usually done by hand, solely because the work of the domestic slave is of no account? In America, they do better. There are already a number of cities in which hot water is conveyed to the house as cold water is in Europe. Under these conditions, the problem was a simple one, and a woman, Miss Cochrane, solved it. Her machine washes 12 dozen plates or dishes wipes them and dries them in less than three minutes. A factory in Illinois manufactures the machines and sells them at a price within the reach of the average middle-class purse. And why should not small households send their crockery to an establishment as well as their boots? It is even probable that the two functions, brushing and washing up, will be undertaken by the same association. Cleaning, rubbing the skin off your hands when washing and wringing linen, sweeping floors and brushing carpets, thereby raising clouds of dust, which afterwards occasion much trouble to dislodge from the places which they have settled down. All this work is still done because woman remains a slave, but it tends to disappear as it can be infinitely better done by machinery. Machinery of all kinds will be introduced into households, and the distribution of motor-powered in private houses will enable people to work them without muscular effort. Such machines cost very little to manufacture, if we still pay very much for them, it is because they are not in general use, and chiefly because an exorbitant tax is levied upon every machine by the gentlemen who wish to live in grand style, and who have speculated on land, raw material, manufacture, sale, patents, and duties. But emancipation from domestic toil will not be brought by small machines only. Households are emerging from their present state of isolation. They begin to associate with other households to do common what they did separately. In fact, in the future, we shall not have a brushing machine, a machine for washing up plates, a third for washing linen, and so on in each house. To the future, on the contrary, belongs the common heating apparatus which sends heat into each room of the whole district and spares the lighting of fires. It is already so in a few American cities. A great central furnace supplies all houses in all rooms with hot water, which circulates in pipes, and to regulate the temperature, you need only to turn a tap. And should you care to have a blazing fire in any particular room, you can light the gas specially supplied for heating purposes from the central reservoir. All the immense work of cleaning chimneys and keeping up fires, and a woman knows what time it takes, is disappearing. Candles, lamp, and even gas have had their day. There are entire cities in which it is sufficient to press a button for a light to burst forth, and indeed, it is a simple question of economy and knowledge to give yourself a luxury of electric light. And lastly, also in America, they speak of forming societies for the almost complete suppression of household work. It would only be necessary to create a department for every block of houses. A cart would come to each door and take the boots to be blacked, the crockery to be washed up, the linen to be washed, the small things to be mended if it were worthwhile, the carpets to be brushed, and the next morning would bring back the things entrusted to all well cleaned. A few hours later, your hot coffee and your eggs done to a nicety would appear on your table. It is a fact that between 12 and 2 o'clock, there are more than 20 million Americans and as many Englishmen who eat roast beef or mutton, boiled pork, potatoes, and a seasonable vegetable. And at the lowest figure, 8 million fires burn during 2 or 3 hours to roast this meat and to cook these vegetables. 8 million women spend their time to prepare this meal that perhaps consists at, at most 10 different dishes. 50 fires burn, wrote an American woman the other day, where one would suffice. Dine at home at your own table with your children if you like, but only think yourself, why should these fifty women waste their whole morning to prepare a few cups of coffee and a simple meal? Why fifty fires, when two people and one single fire would suffice to cook all these pieces of meat and all these vegetables? Choose your own beef or mutton to be roasted if you are particular, season the vegetables to your taste if you prefer a particular sauce, but have a single kitchen with a single fire 
and organize it as beautifully as you are able to. Why has woman's work never been of any account? Why, in every family, are the mother and three or four servants obliged to spend so much time at what pertains to cooking? Because those who want to emancipate mankind have not included woman in their dream of emancipation and consider it beneath their superior masculine dignity to think of the kitchen arrangements, which they have raid on the shoulders of that drudge woman. To emancipate woman, it is not only to open the gates of the university, the law courts, or the parliaments. For her, the emancipated woman will always throw domestic toil onto another woman. To emancipate woman is to free her from the brutalizing toil of kitchen and wash house. It is to organize your household in such a way as to enable her to rear her children, if she be so minded, while still retaining sufficient leisure to take her share of social life. It will come to pass. As we have said, things are already improving. Only let us fully understand that a revolution intoxicated with the beautiful words, liberty, equality, solidarity, would not be a revolution if it maintained slavery at home half humanity subjected to the slavery of the hearth would still have to rebel against the other half. End of chapter 10 The Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin Read by members of Audible Anarchist Chapter 11 of The Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 11. Free Agreement Accustomed as we are, by hereditary prejudices and absolutely unsound education and training, to see government, legislation, and magistracy everywhere around, we have come to believe that man would tear his fellow man to pieces like a wild beast the day the police took his eye off of him. That chaos would come about if authority were overthrown during a revolution. And with our eyes shut we pass by thousands and thousands of human groupings which form themselves freely without any intervention of the law and attain results infinitely superior to those achieved under government tutelage. If you open a daily paper, you find its pages are entirely devoted to government transactions and to political jobbery. A Chinaman reading it would believe that in Europe nothing gets done save by order of some master. You find nothing in them about institutions that spring up, grow up, and develop without ministerial prescription. Nothing, or hardly nothing, even when there is a heading, sundry events. It is because they are connected with the police. A family drama, an act of rebellion, will only be mentioned if the police have appeared on the scene. 350 million Europeans love or hate one another, work or live on their incomes. But, apart from literature, theater, or sport, their lives remain ignored by newspapers if governments have not intervened in some way or other. It is even so with history. We know the least details of the life of a king or of a parliament, all good and bad speeches pronounced by the politicians have been preserved. Quote, speeches that have never had the least influence on the vote of a single member, unquote, as an old parliamentarian said. Royal visits, good or bad humor of politicians, jokes or intrigues, are all carefully recorded for posterity. But we have the greatest difficulty to reconstitute a city of the Middle Ages, to understand the mechanism of that immense commerce that was carried on between Hanseatic cities or to know how the city of Rouen built its cathedral. If a scholar spends his life in studying these questions, his works remain unknown, and parliamentary histories, that is to say, the defective ones, as they only treat one side of social life, multiply, are circulated, are taught in schools. And we do not even perceive the prodigious work accomplished every day by spontaneous groups of men which constitutes the chief work of our century. We therefore propose to point out some of these most striking manifestations, and to prove that men, as soon as their interests do not absolutely clash, act in concert, harmoniously, and perform collective work of a very complex nature. It is evident that in present society, based on individual property, that is to say, on plunder, and on a narrow-minded and therefore foolish individualism, facts of this kind are necessarily few in number. Agreements are not always perfectly free, and often have a mean, if not execrable, aim. 
But what concerns us is not to give examples which we could blindly follow, and which, moreover, present society could not possibly give us. What we have to do is prove that, in spite of the authoritarian individualism which stifles us, there remains in our life, taken as a whole, a great part in which we only act by free agreement, and that it would be much easier than we think to dispense with government. In support of our view, we have already mentioned railways, and we are about to return to them. We know that Europe has a system of railways, 175,000 miles long, and that on this network you can nowadays travel from north to south, from east to west, from Madrid to Petersburg, and from Calais to Constantinople, without stoppages, without even changing carriages when you travel by express. More than that, a parcel thrown into a station will find its addressee anywhere, in Turkey or in Central Asia, without more formality needed for sending it than writing its destination on a bit of paper. This result might have been obtained in two ways. A Napoleon, a Bismarck, or some potentate, having conquered Europe, would from Paris, Berlin, or Rome draw a railway map and regulate the hours of the trains. The Russian Tsar Nicholas I dreamt of taking such action. When he was shown rough drafts of railways between Moscow and Petersburg, he seized a ruler and drew on the map of Russia a straight line between these two capitals, saying, Here is the plan. And the road as was built in a straight line, filling in deep ravines, building bridges of a giddy height, which had to be abandoned a few years later, at a cost of about 120,000 to 150,000 pounds per English mile. This is one way, but happily things were managed differently. Railways were constructed piece by piece, the pieces were joined together, and the hundred diverse companies to whom these pieces belonged came to an understanding concerning the arrival and departure of their trains, and the running of carriages on their rails, from all countries, without unloading merchandise as it passes from one network to another. All this was done by free agreement, by exchange of letters and proposals, by congresses at which delegates met to discuss certain special subjects, but not to make laws. After the Congress, the delegates returned to their companies, not with a law, but with the draft of a contract to be accepted or rejected. There were certainly obstinate men who would not be convinced, but a common interest compelled them to agree without invoking the help of armies against the refractory members. This immense network of railways connected together, and the enormous traffic it has given rise to, no doubt constitutes the most striking trait of our century, and it is the result of free agreement. If a man had foreseen or predicted it fifty years ago, our grandfathers would have thought him idiotic or mad. They would have said, never will you be able to make the shareholders of a hundred companies listen to reason. It is a utopia, a fairy tale, a central government with an iron director can alone enforce it. And the most interesting thing in this organization is that there is no European central government of railways, nothing. No minister of railways, no dictator, not even a continental parliament, not even a directing committee. Everything is done by contract. So we ask the believers in the state, who pretend that we can never do without a central government, were it only for regulating the traffic. We ask them, but how do European railways manage without them? How do they continue to convey millions of travelers and mountains of luggage across a continent? If companies owning railways have been able to agree, why should railway workers, who would take possession of the railways, not agree likewise? And if the Petersburg-Warsaw Company and that of the Paris-Belfort can act in harmony without giving themselves the luxury of a common commander, why, in the midst of our societies, consisting of free groups of workers, should we need a government? End of chapter 11 The Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin Read by members of Audible Anarchist.